Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sim City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. With me again tonight is Sister Renee Rowland. And tonight we're hoping to conclude the study that we've been doing on Paul Washer's famous sermon, Examine Yourself. Uh, so this is uh, part five, and we should be able to finish it up tonight. There's only a, a couple of pages left of a sermon that we need to discuss. Um, if you have not seen the previous videos on this subject, please, uh, you can go back and watch it all from the beginning on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, Sister Renee, before we get started, say hi to everybody and any announcements. Hey, guys. Hey. hey. from Rigel. Yep, Jim and Rigel want to say hello. Uh, finally, we're going to get to the end of this thing, man. Ah, it's painful when they just make their tradition and their Calvinism squeeze it into Scripture instead of addressing, you know, the verse to who the verses are really written to and the context they're written about. And then they put their point and force them in. What is that? Eisegesis, right? When you force your view into the scripture instead of exegesis to take out of scripture what it actually says so i'm looking forward to that uh uh to this tonight that uh we conclude this and just overall why this just disturbs and grieves every one of us and it has nothing to do with us loving sin or any such nonsense it's that it it focuses on man's doing instead of what christ already did for salvation, because salvation is of the Lord, not of man. So I'm happy to be here tonight. Thanks for having me, Brother Luke. Okay. Thank you, Sister. Uh, all right. Um, I think we'll have time tonight to uh, finish his sermon and then uh, kind of do a, a recap of uh, the main points and uh, g give you a conclusion. So let's begin now where we left off last time. And I'll, uh, I'll kind of preach it the way I think he preached it so you can see his, uh, his attitude. <clears throat> now he says, verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. He's trying to show you how horrible sin is because we really don't get it. I love what Watson says in A Body of Divinity. He's always saying this, he goes, quote, you have not sinned against an inferior prince. You've not sinned against a small mayor from a small village. You have sinned against the Lord of glory, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You know not what you've done, unquote. Imagine this, here stands God on the day of creation. He looks at stars that could swallow up a thousand of our sons. He looks at them and he says, quote, all you stars move yourself to this place and start in this order and move in a circle and move exactly as I tell you until I give you another word, unquote. And they all obey him. He says, Planets, pick yourself up and whirl. Make this formation at my command until I give you another word. He looks at a mountain and he says, be lifted up and they obey him. He tells valleys, be cast down and they obey him. He looks at the sea and says, you will come this far and the sea obeys. And then he looks at you and says, come. And you go, no, look at the horrid wretchedness of sin, the vulgarity, the prostitution of sin. It is a horrid thing, not something to be trifled with. As I said, it is a beast and it is waiting at the door and its desires is to have you. And anyone who practices sin outright, open, clenched fist rebellion against the Lord of glory. Now it's here. 
We all realize that the Bible has already taught us that believers will sin, but there is a difference between a believer who sins, confesses their sin, and going on to greater holy. Being uh, let me, can I stop you there? Yes. What's the difference between sinning and practicing it? There's another vague standard. Uh, and again, we got to remind the viewers, this is him trying to get you to see if you're really saved or not which has nothing to do with your behavior. Now, how you are living and walking with God is, is about your spiritual maturity. If you're being properly discipled, because the church of Corinth were carnal people and he had to constantly correct them and remind them who they were in Christ, that salvation is not just so we can go to heaven, but so once we are saved, we can serve and be an example to glorify our Father in heaven because we're zealous of good works. We're saved into good works. So what Mr. Washer seems to be doing is adding your works of righteousness as proof that you're saved. But salvation's assurance is based on God's promise. That all it's based on what Jesus has already done for us. That's salvation. It's the simplicity in Christ that eternal life is a free gift. Mr. Washer seems to think you're earning it, maintaining it, or proving that you have it based on his Calvinistic worldview by your works. And because he said works don't save you, but if you don't have the works, you're going to hell. No, if you don't have the works, you're a bad servant. You're a disobedient son or daughter, not you're not saved because once you're born of God, you're born of God because you've trusted in what Christ did. So I just wanted to remind the viewers, if they haven't watched the others, that this is the context and the entire sermon is based on a wrong contextual understanding of the examine yourself verse, which has nothing to do with you examine yourself to see if you're actually saved. But it was Paul defending himself as an apostle. Because Judaizers had come in and said, Paul's not a real apostle. And so he said, you seek proof of Christ speaking in me. You want to examine me? Examine yourselves. Prove your own selves. Because if Christ is in you, I'm an apostle. So he wasn't saying examine yourselves uh, that you be in the faith to see if you're saved. Examine yourselves because if you're in the faith, then that confirms me as an apostle. So right away, we've got the wrong context of the verse as the foundation for the entire sermon. So this is supposed to be a shocking message to America's youth. And we don't disagree with this because we love sin. Again, it's because you're muddying up the waters of the glorious message of Christ who gets all the glory for our salvation. God is our salvation. We get God's imputed righteousness when we trust in him. So if he, and I think Luke would agree, if he would have divided this and said, hey, you guys are saved because you trusted in Christ. We know everybody's saved by grace through faith. Literally, we're not ashamed of the gospel. That's the way it is. Your behavior has nothing to do with it. Grace isn't fair. Religious people get over it. But if you are saved, you should be doing these things. Let's examine to see if you're growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord. If you're improving in your walk with God, are you live? Are you getting rid of the things that are damaging to your life? The sinful habits that are damaging your testimony. That would have been fine. But the problem here is, and I think Luke will agree is that they're mixing that as evidence that you're saved. And that's wrong because then it's about what you're doing and not what Christ has already done. So when he says practicing sin, Luke, I used to joke and say, I don't need practice. I'm really good at it. But they they say like, okay, so wait a minute. One sin, if you offend in all, you offend in one, you offend in all. It doesn't matter the frequency of sin. It has nothing to do with whether you're saved or not. So he's like, okay, well, if you sin every now and then, again, I think they lower the standards of the law. They don't realize how disgusting self-righteousness is. Pride, sowing discord among brethren, gossip. You know, they, they forget the other sin, the sins they don't know they commit and sins of omission. So I, I'm assuming he's talking about the big ones, Luke, 
fornicating, getting drunk, and you know, all the obvious bad stuff that if you don't do, you must really be saved. You know, it's all the same, same religious outer righteousness that they're checking for. So I wanted to bring everybody up to speed on that. I don't know what practicing sin is. He's taking first John out of context uh, because he's trying to come against the Gnostic teachings, the Antichrist teachings. And he's also telling them to stay away from idolatry. He's, he's telling them the new man versus the old man because the one born of God can't sin. It's impossible for him to sin. Some were denying original sin. That's why he says, uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful. Just that so we have to admit we're a sinner in order to be saved because some were denying that they sin at all. If a man says he has no sin, there's no truth in him. That's what all these things mean. And then the letter's written so their joy may be full so that they can have better fellowship with God and be better fellowship with one another. So these things like practicing sin is of the devil and so forth. Uh, for one thing, the only people that practice sin are unsaved people because we're not sinners anymore. We have God's righteousness. He doesn't see our sin positionally. Uh, but also uh, he's trying to get them to love one another. So uh, the, the whole context here is he's talking to Jewish people about many different things. He's not saying if you practice sin, it proves you're not saved. But being in sin does mean you're serving the devil. We shouldn't serve the devil. We should serve God who saved us. So, I again, I just wanted to clarify that that's very vague, what practicing sin is. Well, um, I'm glad that you uh, you talked about really the, um, the, the foundational error of this whole message of his. Uh, and that's important for pe if people understood that correctly, then they would not be deceived by his false message. They would not be disturbed and heartbroken and crushed as so many people were if they just understood what you said in the beginning, that there is a difference between salvation and service or salvation and discipleship or salvation and ministry work however you prefer to phrase it um, salvation is based upon what jesus has done for us period but service ministry discipleship that's all that's on us okay how well we're serving the lord and being disciples uh, and uh that that's a totally different thing they're not connected salvation is not related to how well we behave, how well we perform. So that's the, that's the thing a person needs to understand, or you will be deceived by Paul Washer and all of these lordship heretics that say, are saying the same kind of a thing. And it's, it's, when, I, when I saw the reaction of the audience that uh, he spoke to, uh, this, this is uh, called the shocking meth message to the youth. Yeah, he's, he, he's talking to a young congregation uh, let's say high school or college age uh, Christians, uh, and they're uh, he is uh, making them question their salvation. He's challenging them and saying, "I doubt you're even saved, only because you don't act the way that the people are, are in South America or the Middle East. You know, they they're dying for their faith. You don't have real Christianity." So. Uh, he, he's got a false foundation that he's basing this whole message on. And it's important if you are a Christian, why do I say Christian? This is really, this will really settle the whole thing. It's because it's about Christ, not us. He's making about you and me. My salvation was not based upon what I did. It's based upon what Jesus did for me. Amen. It's not determined by, uh, you know, what I continue to do. It's, you know, it's done, it's settled, it's finished based on what Jesus did. My behavior does not uh, determine where I get saved or keep my salvation or I prove that I'm truly saved. None of my, my, my behavior doesn't determine any of that. But that's what he's making, the false assumption. And what he has to do is take verses, break them in half, 
insert his false uh, ideas, eisegesis, inserting it in, and, and then trying to twist the verses to, to support his false doctrine. Now, let's go to the chat room. I saw a lot of interesting things in there a few minutes ago when you were talking, Renee. Uh, it started when uh, RL said, uh, said that, uh, let me see, let me find that. Oh, a lot of comments says, uh, sin is not lawlessness. That's blatantly incorrect. So I asked RL, well, what, can you give us a definition of sin? Uh, and RL says, uh, um, sin is to miss the mark by setting up a target that doesn't belong there and then condemning self and others for the failure to hit the bullseye on a false target. I think that's an interesting point. And a lot of people probably are not even aware of the really, there, there's two points, missing the mark. But then the other point is there's a target that shouldn't even be there uh, because um, the, 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 the target was set up with Adam and Eve when they decided to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they, they were saying, well, if I know what's right and wrong is, I can, I can target to do the right all the time. But God's intention was never to give us a target to strive for to hit the bullseye. God's intention was for us just to rely on him for everything. Uh, so as long as we have a target that we're shooting at, we're, 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 we're missing the whole point anyway, and that is that let's just rely on Jesus. Let's focus on Jesus. Depend on Jesus for salvation. Depend on Jesus to transform us. Depend on Jesus to guide us. And uh, you don't have to worry about setting up targets. But, sister, uh, the idea of what sin is, and there's more people putting definitions for sin, but um, according to Jesus... Jesus wanted us all to know that there's no escape from from condemnation for sin because we're not we're he, to the Jews he's talking about the commandments you know the because they were under Mosaic law 613 laws written down 10 of those written in stone by the finger of God 10 commandments so Jesus used those laws as the target to show them how they failed but he said look it's not just actually murdering someone it's even having a hateful thought is equal to murder because you've murdered them already in your mind and he goes on and on but he's making the point that if you think that you can wiggle out of your the, the guilt of sin by uh saying well i i, I didn't uh, i haven't lied lately i haven't committed adultery he wants you to know that every bad thought you have is a sin so bad thoughts bad actions, and even, fail, even failure to do good every minute of your life. Anytime you're idle and not out there doing good, you're sinning. That's the sin of uh, negligence or, or uh, uh, omission. Omission, yes. Hey, Luke, so, he yeah. misses the point there, too. When you're saying, when he goes, whosoever abides in him sinneth not, that's a statement of fact. If you're in Christ, you're not sinning. That's mm -hmm. not saying that if you're really saved, you won't sin. It's saying it's not a sin to be in Christ. It's a sin to not abide in Christ. He's missing that, but he's making it. Do you see what I mean? He's yeah. turning it into a performance issue, but it's really a statement of identity there. Yeah. Yeah. And it is an important thing to um, understand that the Bible actually says that we are always sinning. And yet the Bible says that we cannot sin as Christians. How, how do you reconcile those two opposing contradictory statements in the Bible? It clearly says that it's basically it's impossible for a Christian to sin. And yet it's saying that if you say you have no sin, you can deny yourself. Uh, you, uh, the truth is not in you. And then the end of the letter, he says, I write to you, little children, so that you sin not. Yes. So if you can't sin, he's talking about the new man, the spirit, versus the old man. And that's what he's not, that's what he's mixing up here. Yeah. 
Snakes in the flesh versus so, spirit. You know, we have a group of people. Uh, I've dealt with them over the years. Uh, that, that it's a, it's a, a group of Lordship Salvation preachers that preach sinless perfection. But I can actually say that I have sinless perfection. And I can also say that I, I'm a, still a sinner. Uh, and it, because uh, the, the, the new man and the regenerated uh, born again uh, is uh, already in Christ. So I'm sinless. I cannot sin. And yet I'm still living this body of flesh as Paul's called it. And uh, woe is me because the, because the, you're talking about how you're you don't need to practice sin you're already good at it it's because sin comes naturally to us the most natural thing in the world for a, a, any person christian or non-christian it's natural to sin no one has to be taught how to sin it's uh, it's our it's our nature and only with the new birth and the the um uh, renewing of the Holy Spirit, changing our desires. Does does there actually a, a, an observable change in people that you can see? Okay, let, I'll read a little more. Uh, okay. Okay. Now it's here. We all realize that the Bible's already taught us that believers will sin. But there is a difference between a believer who sins. Oh, wait a second. I thought I already covered that. Okay. There's a big, big difference between a believer who sins, confesses their sin, and going on to greater holy, being di dis disciplined of the Lord, but going on to greater holiness, and someone who just out and out practices sin as a habitual lifestyle. Okay. Sister, this, this distinction that he's making there... Uh, what do you have to say about that? Uh, some people seem to be more blatant sinners. Uh, even pe people who are professing Christians, who um, even have the right confession of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and yet you can see that their life doesn't seem to reflect it. And then uh, someone else, they have the right confession and their life seems to reflect that there, there's a huge change in their life. What should, conclusion should we draw from that as he's trying to make this distinction here? You still with me, Renee? Yeah, I'm look. I'm reading the section again. He's drawing, he's comparing two people, one who uh, will occasionally sin and they feel horror about it and repent versus someone else who is just habitually sinning. Right. I would well, say that a person's out of fellowship, not, uh, not lost. But again, like you said, he's mixing the old man and the new man here. And when John says he who does righteous is righteous. Yeah, but all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They they can't get us saved. It has nothing to do with being saved. He's rebuking these people for not loving their brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I'm starting to think he's rebuking them for not loving their Hebrew brethren, their Jewish brethren, by possibly not telling them the gospel or something. Because he's saying that uh, uh, little children, he's usually talking to saved people there. But since John's uh, ministry was to the Jewish people, I, I have to divide whether he's talking to Jewish believers or just all Jewish people in general, because he does mention those that were not of us, those that are antichrist. And then he's uh, telling them to stay away from idolatry and to uh, for their joy to be full, how to have better fellowship with God and with each other. And so he goes on about, you know, how... Um, how he who does righteous is righteous. Uh, but again, that has nothing to do. I hate it when they use these verses because we didn't see the letter John's responding to, you know, all the issues. We can only historically look at what was going on and kind of figure out what each, because you'll see he jumps from one subject to another very abruptly as if he's responding to a letter written to him. And I'm sure he was. It was probably the Jerusalem church had written him 
uh, and he was probably on Patmos or in prison somewhere, and he uh, is responding to them. So uh, it's clear here these verses are him trying to encourage the brethren to love one another, to stay away from idolatry, and to practically be righteous, to be righteous in their actions. But that, again, this isn't salvific. This thing is not salvific. He confirms what's true, what the true doctrines are, you know, uh, that Jesus is the son of God, that he rose again from the dead, that there's many in there that are antichrist, denying him, that those only those who have the son have the father. Even if they're Jewish, they're not of God anymore. They've rejected Christ. They're not of God. They don't have the father. And then he goes on. Uh, to confirm some things that everybody sins, and we've got to confess that we are sinners. And the whole thing's about, then it continues about fellowship with one another and with God, so the joy may be full. So to me here, he's just encouraging the, their good behavior, but it has nothing to do with salvation at all, to me. Well, um, I'm looking at uh, the comments here at chat room. Um, RL is speaking for you, Renee, and uh, it's probably, I mean, you know, it's okay if you, if you are, as long as you're rep, not misrepresenting someone, but the statement he's saying here, you could be speaking for me, Brother Mike, because I do, do agree with this point, and he says to, uh, to Priscilla Smith, Renee Rowland will say, it means that if you confess you are a sinner in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ, then you are forgiven and cleansed once for all of all yes. righteousness. That is what I would say. That's what I would say. But here's yeah. the thing. You know how you, you read the Bible, um, for me, for 32 years now. And over, over the years, um, I'll read and hear a verse. And even though I've read the verse, 10 times, 20 times before, all of a sudden you get an epiphany, a revelation. Uh, God reveals a meaning to you that you didn't see the first 20 times. And a lot of times it's so simple. You go, how did I miss that? Uh, the point I'm going to make is, is also the same point when we were talking about the verse the other day that people are misusing, saying that, uh, when Jesus says, if you de uh, deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. So most people think that's talking to a Christian saying, you better not, as a Christian, ever deny me or you'll lose your salvation, you know. Uh, but it, that, that verse is just talking to the world in general. You need to confess or believe that Jesus is your savior and then you're good good with God and, and you're saved. Uh, but if, if you deny that fact, that Jesus is your savior, uh, then he'll deny you. It's, it's, it's talking broadly to the whole world, not directing to Christians saying, you can't renounce, renounce your faith. Absolutely. I think this verse here that they're pointing out here about, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I think those verses are not intended to the believer, but they're I to agree. the unbeliever in the audience. See, You see, when we talk in uh, church to the whole congregation, some people in the congregation are believers and they got it all right. And some people don't understand, and you've got to explain the basics even to the congregation. So that point should be to the whole congregation. This is the principle. If, if we understand that we're sinners, because we've all sinned, and uh, if you deny that you're a sinner, that there's your problem. You need to accept the fact you are a sinner. And But if you confess the fact, or if you acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, he will forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's the gospel, yeah. message. That's the gospel message. When uh, so. You remember when they said to Jesus, why do you eat with those sinners? They mm -hmm. didn't recognize their own sin. And then he said, I didn't call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, they, they, they thought they were righteous. They don't sin. They really believe even tithing on their herb gardens. 
that they were they were without sin. The rich young ruler said, all these I've kept since my youth. He, he wouldn't have thought he was a sinner. I'm, I don't sin. I got people now saying I haven't sinned in 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Now I, I asked you uh, if you could make the distinction that he's making and explain it. There's one person that's habitually sinning. They have the right confession. They say what we say, but their life is, you look what observe their life and they, they don't take sin seriously. They just go ahead and sin and there it's a habitually sinning. And, and another person, they have the right confession and yet their life, you can see a dramatic change in their life, their interests and desires and conduct. Everything's different than it used to be. So my explanation of that is there are levels of maturity in a Christian. Yes. Some people, some people, maybe they're very mature right away, right after they get yep. saved. They, 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 they grow and mature quickly. Right. Other people, slow maturity, if any at all, in their whole lifetime. It's just like That's because it depends on the word of God. You grow in grace and in knowledge through the word of God. So yeah. if you're not spending time in the word of God or fellowshipping with a, a discipleship with others, you're not going to grow. You're going to remain a carnal babe in Christ and then just go on with the world. But that doesn't mean you're not saved. Yeah. And like what he's trying to say is that if you practice sin with impunity, you're like, I'm just going to do this and do this. And I don't care because I'm saved anyway. I don't really know people like that. I mean, I've got some Christians that I know are saved that struggle with sin, uh, but they just feel guilt ridden over it. They're having terrible consequences because it says that God chastises his children. So if, you, if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard and not a son. So uh, this guy, Paul Walter, seems to be so worried somebody might get away with some sin in their life and think they're still going to heaven. But God takes care of his own children. Mm -hmm. You will suffer consequences here on this earth. And there's also loss of reward, whatever that looks like, whether you believe it's here or eternal. I'm not here to argue that, but it's clear that that happens. So it, he seems to be saying that if you have a habit of sin, but we know that's not true. We know it's not true that a saved person won't have habitual sin because St. Paul tells the Corinthian church, if a brother is overtaken with a sin, that means his whole life is consumed with this habitual sin habit that he has. So we know a saved person can fall into that. And we as believers are supposed to help them through it, but make sure we have a grip on it. And it's not our own personal weakness. So we don't get drugged down with them. So he's trying to say that if you keep, if you just sin away, you're not really saved and, and then you're deceiving yourself. No, that's not true because we're saved. If you've, if you you and your behavior has nothing to do with whether you have put all of your trust in what Jesus already did for you, whether you believe the gospel and the, the religious people hate this, Luke, but we're not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation for everyone that believes, but they want to make an excuse or put limitations on it. But Paul says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not again and taken on the yoke of bondage. But he also says, don't use that liberty as an occasion to the flesh. But these people will say, uh, if you do use that liberty, it shows you're not really saved. But that's not true. We're instructed not to do that because our whole purpose of continuing to live on this earth once God does save us is to glorify him and serve him and be zealous of good works. It just means you're a, a, not a good servant or an immature carnal Christian. Mm -hmm. It doesn't determine. As a matter of fact, Brother Luke, you and I said one night, some people I think that are honest with themselves and have a habitual sin in their life, they trust God's grace more than the religious people do. Because part of their security is in how good they live now instead of what Christ has done for them. Mm -hmm. Well, I've I've been pushing this point of view for um, all of the ministers, everybody who is uh, preaching the gospel, defending the true gospel of faith alone, no works are required, and we are confronted with people who are 
saying, that's not enough. You've got to have a changed life. You got to get sin out of your life. You got to produce works. And, and how do you deal with that person? Well, what I'm seeing by almost everybody I, I uh, can think of, when they encounter the lordship heretic, they and they start uh, defending themselves uh, against the lordship heretic instead of turning it around and pointing to the lordship heretic and putting them under the, the spotlight. And that's what I, I've attempted to do in my series called The Challenge. And we need to reverse it around, put them on the defensive, and tell them, wait a second, you're, you're saying that this person who has habitual sin? Well, I would say to Paul Washer, well, let me ask you something. You don't have any habitual sin in your life, Paul? Uh, what, well, what about spiritual pride? It seems obvious to me. A lot of people who look at you and see the, the message and the attitude that you're having, it's clear to us that you're full of self-righteousness and spiritual pride, and that's the way you feel about yourself every day. So uh, um, we need to just show them that they cannot live up to the standard that they're trying to impose on everybody else. And that's why we need to do what Jesus did. He ratcheted it down. He tightened the, the law so tightly. He said, oh, you say that you, if, you, if you murder someone, it's a sin? Well, I'm saying if you even hated someone, it's murder. He, that's what he was doing. He was making, giving them no wiggle room so that no one can wiggle out of it and act like that they, they're not a sinner too. And that's what we need to do to Paul Washer and any lordship heretic that starts telling us that, then we need to turn around on them and say, well, tell me when you, after you got saved, did you completely stop sinning? Yeah, I, I know. I, I Also, Luke, the thing is, once you really get the revelation, like I, I'm going to do a video because no such thing as an ex-Christian. There is, uh, there comes a time when God, through his word, has to fully persuade your heart of what he's done for you. When you get the revelation of how much God loves you and how he sees you, how his like version of you is so different than your distorted version of yourself, there's no way you want to offend God more, stay in a bunch of sin, whatever they're talking about, because you love your dad and you know who you are. You don't want to do it more just because you're secure. It doesn't promote that. The strength of sin is the law, not God's grace. God's love is, is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the love of God, love of Christ that constrains us. It's not They don't get that. And I, I don't understand how anybody who has the Holy Spirit that's gotten the full revelation to put their trust only what Jesus did, and like you doing the happy dance. They, they should be so joyful and so excited to tell everybody about Jesus, but they're not because they're not, they, they, they can't give good news. They're, they're, they've got to tell them how they've got to stop this behavior and give up those sins that they like and turn or burn. That's not good news and it's not the gospel and it saves no one. And that's what they do. The, the people like him, they tell people, if you want to be saved, you got to give up those sins in your life and, and believe on Jesus. That's not salvation. It's not. And if they add that, you're not saved. You have not believed the gospel. If that is what you think saves you, you have not believed the gospel. I, I'm trying to get this through to people. Again, another video made against me today. Anything to nitpick at me. Anything, even going into my comment section to falsely accuse. Everything comes against this true gospel message. They hate it. And it's all professing Christians that are coming against the truth of the gospel. Not one of us would promote sin because th the way this man's talking, he acts like we're we all that are saved and secure. We're just going around going, woohoo, I can sin away now. I can fornicate. And I can be a junkie and I'm going to be a prostitute and I'm going to kill my enemies and I'm going to do everything I really want to do because I'm saved anyway. What? I don't know anybody that's 
really gotten saved. I mean, truly gets what Christ did for them, feels the love he has for them, and wants to hurt him. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see that. And I don't know why they keep accusing us of it. You know, I've uh, I've been reading his sermon now for uh, uh, quite a while, and I've tried to deliver it the way I saw him. I watched the video of him delivering this. Let me let me do something right now here. Okay, this is this is Paul Washer. I am so broken hearted that you're such a sinner. Don't you know how much you're hurting God? Oh, I'm thankful I'm not like you. Look at the sacrifices I make in my life. Why can't you be more like me? That's really the concept. That's the whole theme of his message. You guys are so horrible. You're just horrible sinners. You're not real Christians like me. Does that sound familiar to you, sister? Is there someone in the Bible that comes to mind? Sorry. The last thing you said, yes, please say it again. That message, that attitude is uh -huh. in the Bible that comes to mind that you that is behaves like that in the Bible. I will tell you that it's the Pharisee. Well, the Pharisee and the I'm prophet. so glad I'm not like these. Yeah, but, and who else? I do the this. Brother, I do that. The brother of the prodigal son. Yes. Yeah. I don't do that. I've always done what you told me to do. Yeah. And then bitter because the son is still loved. So uh, Paul Washer and all of the other lordship heretics, they're all so deluded. They don't want you say they don't want that sinner over there. How dare that guy think he's saved and still have that habit? How, how dare he? And they say, we say, God can't change us. Of course he can. But that takes work and your free will to work with the Holy Spirit to do it. That's not an automatic thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and force us to live right, whatever that means. Yeah. You know, they, they act like that. And then they say, we, we don't believe. Well, I don't trust God just to change me. I trusted him to save me. They're trusting God to change them. So that they're righteous enough to earn their salvation. I'm trusting God to save me, period. And and will grow and get better because I'm saved. I don't even think about sin anymore. I don't even think about it. I'm just happy. I, God's my father. I talk to him all day. And then when I get ready to say something mean to somebody that made me mad in traffic, I'll hear that little voice. Uh, 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 like it would hurt. So I don't. I just listen to that spirit. I don't think about sin. Okay, today I promise I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z. That's exactly how I set myself up to fail. Mm -hmm. Salvation's not a New Year's resolution. It is good news what God did for us. But they don't believe it. Luke, they don't believe the gospel. There are Christians that don't believe the gospel. Or not Christians, but professing ones. You know what I mean. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. They're bitter. They're angry. You hear them whining all the time. Oh, sin. Oh, sin. And if I'm wrong, I should tremble. But I'm not wrong. Yes, you are. You are very wrong. You're preaching another gospel and you stand a curse for it. Well, I'm not the first one uh, to use the term modern day Pharisees. Uh, but uh, it certainly is a perfect description of the lordship heretics that we encounter. Um, I, I see Jesus um, befriending prostitutes, tax collectors, which were the most despised people in the Jewish community. They're taking, they're Jewish, and yet they could, they're taking taxes from their own people for the Romans. And but Jesus takes the people who are most despised and uh embracing them and but the people who are supposed to be the very best that they can, that the judaism has to offer the most religious pharisees the most religious sect of judaism he says you guys are whitewashed tombs you're snakes you're hypocrites harlots and publicans will enter the kingdom before you will yeah 
Um, so, all right, let me read on. Otherwise, we won't get through it again even tonight if we don't, <laughs> we don't continue. Okay, I'll go on. Uh, now, now, verse 6. Uh, no one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Again, it's talking about a style of life, of practicing sin. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. Now, I'm telling you this. Little children, adults, make sure no one deceives you. Make sure some pastor doesn't deceive you. Make sure your mama doesn't deceive you. Your dad doesn't deceive you. Or some well-meaning carnal Christian does not deceive you. He says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. You practice sin as a habitual lifestyle. You love what you can get away with. My friend, you're of the devil. Now let's go back to verse 12 of the final chapter, chapter 5. The last test. This is a series of tests that he's taken from 1 John to test whether someone's really a Christian. He says, there's many more, but we don't have time this evening. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. Jesus, you know, it's almost absurd to ask this question. We've actually come to believe in American Christianity that you can be a Christian and Jesus and not be all the world to you. Do you love Jesus? What do you think most about? What do you think about most? I know men who love the ministry more than they love Jesus. I know men who love the Bible more than they love Jesus. What do you think about most? Because that's what you love. Now, my dear friend, listen to me. I've got to make a stop here, uh, correct a few things. There are some struggling believers here tonight that need to realize something. Again, we are not talking about sinless perfection. We are not saying that if you're a true Christian, Christ will always be at the forefront of your thoughts. We're not saying if you're a true Christian, you are always going to be practicing righteousness. Again, what we're talking about is a style of life, a struggle. Vague, vague, vague. See the vague standard there? Uh, st just, you know, you, you don't practice it. You're not completely perfect. But so you're still looking at your behavior. Now we don't know where the line is. You know what, Luke? We know where the do we make void the law through faith? Uh, God forbid, yea, we established the law. Here it is, and guess what? You fall short of it because you didn't keep it perfectly in thought, word, and deed, so pff, it's out. You can't be saved by it. No vague standard for us. We're saved because of what Jesus already did. Don't look at your behavior for salvation. That way we don't have, because this, what this is doing is telling people, if you don't meet his vague standard of righteousness, not perfect, but you better not love sin. Or you better, you're really of the devil. You're not saved. You see what I mean? It's vague. He's not, he's making this a salvific issue and it's not. And so where's the standard? It's his, but we don't know what that standard is. You know, uh, what about the monk? We got to live up to a monk standard? Or what if we were like a junkie prostitute? Do you going to give us some time to get off the dope and quit turning tricks or how, and what if we're still doing it for a while till we get it together? Are we saved while we're doing it? You see what I mean? It's all vague. It, it makes me crazy when they do this, Luke. You you mentioned earlier about my happy dance. Now, I anybody, love it. If anybody listening now or, or in the chat room doesn't know about my happy dance, it's something I do to make a point, but it's also real. It's a demonstration of the joy that I have knowing of the promise of eternal life that I got from Jesus. I can't help but being joyful. 
and I'm, I can only be joyful and remain joyful if it doesn't depend on my ability because I don't have the ability to be perfect. And if I could be perfect for a moment, I can't maintain it. So I can't have joy if it's based on me, but I can have joy if it's based and promised by Jesus. But Paul Washer and all the Lordship heretics Listen to his preaching. I tried to imitate him. There's no joy in him. It's grief. It's 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 just a horrible state of depression. Of oh, you're so horrible. I'm just so heartbroken. You're not saved. And you know. And then the self righteousness he has about himself. Where's the joy? It, I don't see it in him. I don't see it in his message. And the people listening certainly will not be joyful. They're never going to be secure, never knowing, never having the blessed assurance, the confidence, the guarantee that I enjoy because it's not based upon how well I perform. Let me read on. I tell my mother, Mom, the greatest evidence that you're a Christian is the fact that right now you're in the word and God's pointing out to you your sin. The mere fact of, of you, you need to hear this. The mere fact that you struggle with the fact that you don't love him enough is evidence that you're a believer. The mere fact that you look at your own life and you realize you're not as holy or righteous as you want to be and it bothers you is evidence that you've come to know him. What I'm preaching against tonight is the person who lives in habitual sin, who loves the world and all these different things, or a person sliding in that direction or a person who just, yes, Jesus is a little accessory onto my life. The, the warning is for that person. You know, I hear these preachers today and they'll preach and they'll go, man, you've got it all. I've heard them give this kind of invitation. Man, you've got it all. You've got a wonderful, beautiful family. You've got your health. You've got a wonderful job and all these things. You just lack one more thing to make your life complete. You lack Jesus. Makes me want to vomit. My friend, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son has nothing. All your wealth, all your health, all your relations, everything you have is dung if Jesus is not Lord and Savior and passion of your life. He's not an accessory that you add on to an already great life. He is life. That's why he meant, you know, you drink my blood and you eat my flesh. What was he talking about? He's not some accessory. He's the very source of your life. Is he yours? Is he yours? Well, the thing is, there's so many things he says in this sermon. I can say, amen. We should love Jesus so much. We should be thankful for Jesus. We should be focused on Jesus. I have a, ti a, a video titled, Let's Stay Focused on Jesus. I've said many times, it's not a sin issue. It's a son issue. If we stay focused on the son of God, we're not going to be thinking, thinking about sinning because we're too busy thinking about Jesus and the other believers and fellowship. By the so, way, you can't make yourself love God because he's saying we don't love him enough. You want to know why his parishioners don't love God? Because they don't have the real gospel. Because those forgiven much love much. When you get that you did nothing to deserve it, it's God's character. It's his faithfulness. It's his love that saved you. It has nothing to do with your performance. You can't deserve it. You can't qualify for it. It's insulting to his grace and to the suffering of Christ. That's why people don't love God enough in his church. Because they haven't been given anything. All I'm hearing is you got to do. You got to do. Give this up for God. Do this for God. Stop these sins for God. Stop loving your sin. You can't make your flesh stop loving what it loves. They've got to be saved first. 
then the Holy Spirit will help them desire different things. But the flesh, the old guy, he's still going to want it. But the thing is, you can't make yourself love God. You can pretend to. You can be righteous and go, I love what God loves and I hate what he hates. That's why I hate the gay people. And they'll use it as an excuse. But if they have the real love of God in there, they tell them how much God loves them just like they are. You know, God hates self-righteousness. Like, that's the worst. Sowing discord among brethren. That's abomination. So, uh, the only people Jesus even spoke harshly to were the self-righteous Pharisees. So the reason his people in his church don't love God enough is because they haven't received his love yet. They've got a limited savior that only died for some because he is a Calvinist, right? So they only died for the special people. And in his mercy, he did save some of us, you know, can't judge God. And, and they haven't had full revelation of God's love or what Jesus accomplished that we get God's righteousness just because he loved us and became our sin. No. How can we love God when we haven't received his love yet? They haven't. They haven't. What they're hearing is I'll scratch your back. If you scratch mine, I'll save you. If, and you got to qualify, I'll save you if you're good enough. And they're trying to make them create works of the Holy Spirit, fruit of the Holy Spirit through works of their flesh instead of getting them saved with the true gospel, receiving God's full love, not limited in any way, then they would automatically love God. Why? Because the Spirit of God would live in them. So he's trying to make people from the outside do what the Holy Spirit would naturally do if he just preached the gospel and not be ashamed of it and backload works and call it grace. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. I'm sorry. I had to go off. There's a, there's a, a concept in the Bible that's very important for people to understand. And the term is born again, the new birth, born from above, reborn spiritually. We talk a lot about that because that's what a Christian is. A Christian is born again. Uh, reborn spiritually uh, if you if you're not born again you're not a Christian I remember right after I got saved I started going to church and hanging out with some Christians and I was identifying myself as a born again Christian and one guy he says Luke it's you don't need to say born again Christian because born again means Christian if you're a Christian you're born again if you're born again you're a Christian so if you're not born again you're not a Christian well, that that's that's very true, but I, I wanted to make the distinction because uh, how many people do we know who identify themselves as some kind of a Christian? That's what I would call Christendom. Everybody who checks off, okay, there's a questionnaire. What's your religion? Oh, Christian. You check it off. But what does that mean to the person? How would you define that? What is a Christian? <clears throat> That's why I like to say Christian, <clears throat> because a Christian is someone who relies completely on Christ for their salvation. <clears throat> it's about Christ, not yourself. But Paul Washer and all the other lordship heretics, uh, they bring the, the, the person and make it an equation. Jesus plus your own works. That's salvation. And you have got to have them both. But we talked a lot about this. We've tried to explain it every way possible. Uh, I've talked about it's not a question of salvation. It's a question of spiritual maturity. Where are you? What level of maturity are you in your life? Um, but when we're born again spiritually, I, I can compare it to the, the physical birth. If you take three people that are born today and you track their lives, one person may become a huge success as a young person. They're great successes in life at a young age. Another person becomes very successful, but gradually over a lifetime to build that success. And the other person, their whole life, they never can succeed at anything. They're a, fa they're a failure. But all three are equally born 
All three are equally human. There's not one that's more human than the other. It's degrees of success in life. And it's the same thing with success as a Christian. How successfully are, are we growing into a mature, productive Christian? That's what the question is. But we don't use that to, to determine if someone is a Christian. Right. That's right. You got it right. He's making the root, the fruit. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, now, we're about to finish up his sermon here. But I, what I realized is that I listened to his sermon. I watched it. You can find it online. And you can watch him give this sermon. I remember watching it and uh, listening to him do part of the sermon. He talked about the concept of a carnal Christian. And his message was that there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Oh, is that why Paul said, I come to you as carnal, as unto babes in Christ? And then himself said, I am carnal, sold under sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he obviously yeah. didn't read the Church of Corinth's letters. Yeah, but I noticed that we're almost finished with the text. Now, we're, I'm reading the text of his sermon. But this particular text does not include that part where he said he goes no. into the explanation of why if you're carnal you're not a christian there's no yeah it all, he also had that if works don't save you but if you don't have to works, you're going to hell it might be on another video yeah so i, I uh, think is this the same is this one that's examined yourself is this the same one as shocking message to america's youth i think it, it is but i think okay. he, he has different like let's say you have uh, 30 pages in your sermon and sometimes you give 20 uh -huh. here and there on different parts of it not necessarily oh, have to see oh, Every time you know mm. uh, but the idea of uh, not being a carnal Christian uh, he's expressed it without using the, that terminology this whole message is saying you can't hear habitually yeah. sin. If, not, if you have a habitual sin all the time in your life you're not really saved yeah so that's just saying, we don't know that standard you know, though and if you don't love God enough too, Luke what we got to love God we yeah. got to live right we got to have a desire for things of God. We got to hate sin. All the things the Holy Spirit would do as we grew in grace if he just preached the real gospel. And you wouldn't have to tell people to do it because the spirit would be working in it. Mm -hmm. But because it's a false, accursed gospel, I guarantee most of the congregation is not saved. Because if I heard this garbage and he was telling people and he was making this a salvific issue, I couldn't sit there for one sermon. Much less week after week. Yeah. I couldn't. Now, I've uploaded over 900 videos. And some probably I can't even remember, but I'm, most of them I can recall. And there was one I made titled Carnal Christians. And I'm proving the point in that video. If there is such a thing as a carnal Christian, it was an answer to Paul Washer and those who say, if you're carnal, you're not a Christian. There's no such thing as a carnal Christian. And of course, you immediately go to the Apostle Paul. What does he say? First of all, he's talking to the Corinthian church and he starts off by telling them that they're babes in Christ and they're carnal. First of all, if you're a babe in Christ, that means you are in Christ, but you're a babe. You just got in Christ just recently. You haven't grown and matured yet. You're a babe in Christ. So you truly are a Christian. But in this case, they haven't matured and they're carnal they're worldly they're still involved in some kinds of sins and and their life hasn't uh, dramatically changed so paul is addressing that but paul also confesses that he that probably if we took a poll we'd say he's the greatest apostle i'm stepping away but i'm still listening i just can't answer right this second okay. but i'm listening okay I'll be right back so I think that the consensus of all the people who study the Bible a lot and preach the gospel, the majority would vote for Paul and say he's the greatest Christian of all, or greatest, greatest apostle. And yet he identifies himself, he says, and I am carnal. And he goes on and explains about his struggles with sin. But he, he concludes it's not really him sinning, it's his flesh. Because the new man, the regenerated, born-again Paul, cannot sin. 
because he's, we cannot sin if we're in Christ. But the, the old man that's still the body of flesh and has the sin nature sins naturally. It's so natural to, see, to sin. We don't have to learn how. We don't have to practice it get, to get good at it. We're just natural born sinners. And Paul was saying that. Even he, the greatest apostle, was still having this struggle between the old man and the new man. The sinner and the non-sinner. So if Paul, the, being the greatest, was a carnal Christian, as he said, I am carnal, and the, the, the Corinthian church were babes in Christ, truly Christians, but babes, and yet they were called carnal by Paul. Yeah, That's I did true. a video, and I just kept repeating it. There's no such thing as a carnal Christian. I come to you as carnal. There's no such thing as a carnal Christian. I am carnal. There's no such thing as a carnal Christian. I come to you as carnal, as in the babes in Christ. <laughs> like, yeah. Who's right? The Bible or Paul Washer? Yeah. Okay. So, Peter uh, says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. And those that stole, uh, Paul says, let them that steal, steal no more. I mean, it shows you right there they can do terrible things. Yeah. You don't lose the old man when you get saved. All right. I'm going to finish this up here. There's only a couple of paragraphs left. Now he says, let's pray. Father, we've come before you in the name of your son. And Lord, this has been long and hard, but I felt a measure of grace in it. Lord, and I pray, I pray, dear Lord, that you would work in the hearts of people that you would save that you would convert that Lord, even some of your people who may have been sliding into the things of the world, that this has been used as a dis discipline to turn them to others. Lord, who believe themselves saved, that this has been used to show them they are not saved and to struggling believers that it has been used to show them that assuredly they are believers. God, use your word to do many things than what we could ever think or believe. In Jesus' name, amen. At least he admits that you can be saved and fall into backsliding. Yeah. Yeah. But that makes me funny when they go backsliding. Because I'm like, uh, wait a minute. How, what was your level of righteousness you thought you were sustaining before you slid back? Like, how righteous did you think you were? And why were you thinking you were righteous if you back? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. What did you have to start doing? To think that you were backsliding from some level of outer righteousness. Well, I I don't know if I'm right about this, but I I, I think that every believer is um, either in a state of growing or sliding. We, we don't just stay static at any point. Mm, I got you. And and uh, so uh, we will grow. And we will mature if, what do, what do we need to do to grow and mature? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you got to be a real Christian. you got to be born. And to be born of God, you put your faith completely in the Savior and his finished work on the cross as the means of your salvation. Your sins are paid for. You're going to go to heaven because Jesus guaranteed it to you. That's it. And then once that's done, now you want to grow into a mature, productive Christian. Christian, I should say. But is there anything you can do to, to assure this growth? Well, there's, there are things that you can do and things you should do. I mean, if you, if you neglect these things, you probably will not mature and be productive as a, as a Christian. Uh, of course, one thing is Bible. This, you know, the word of God, it's a. Uh, and by the way, it's how we grow in grace. 
through the milk of the word. Yes. Uh, here, uh, here's a little illustration. Uh, this man uh, is married. They love each other so much. And he tells his wife, I have to go away for a long time. I'm not sure how long I'll be gone, but I'll, I'll send you letters. And uh, after a long, long time, he returns. And he sees the letters he sent to his wife just piled in the corner and not one letter was opened. And he says to his wife, look at all the letters I sent you, all these love letters. And you never even bothered to open them and read them? Well, that's how we should look at this. This is These are love letters from God. That's an amazing analogy, Luke. But you know what? If you're unsaved and you read the Bible, you're going to grow in error and condemnation. Mm -hmm. But this here... How many people in their home have this on their bookshelf just getting dusty? And it's like a trophy you put on your bookshelf. Uh, and then the next Yeah, thing, when uh, St. Paul said the Bible is the sword of the spirit, he didn't mean you throw it at a demon. You got to know it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to speak it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Bible, the Bible called, uh, you know, the, the Bible says we don't live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God, and that word of God is found here. This is where we get this daily bread. Uh, and then uh, another thing we need to grow, so that's that's our spiritual food. Another thing we need to do, grow to do is is uh, prayer. Let me compare this to to marriage again. Okay, let's say that. Uh, every time that I saw my wife, I have three sentences that I say to her, and it's the same every time, and that's it. I repeat it, blah, 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 blah. Well, the first time she hears that, she might listen and try to understand and interact with me and but then the next time she hears me say that, and the next time, and the next time, she's going to think, what's wrong with you? And that, that's not a conversation we're having. Prayer is uh, conversations with God. You take turns talking and listening. That's a conversation. But, and, and that's how you build a, a, an intimate relationship, by communicating with each other. But if all we do is just memorize a prayer like Jesus criticized them, and this is what the Roman Catholics do, it's, it's vain repetitions that you just repeat mindlessly. Uh, so prayer, Paul says that we should continue instant in prayer. There's another way he says uh, we should continually pray. Uh, but uh, I love the phrase continue instant in prayer. If you really analyze it, uh, continue, so we continue praying. But am I praying now, sister? Are you praying now? No, we're not praying now because I'm talking. I'm trying to communicate. You're listening to me. So there's no prayer going on because right. my mind is on the conversation. But when the conversation <clears throat> is over, when your task is done and your mind is freed, instantly you should continue the, your prayer. Continue instant in prayer. Your prayer is a continuous reason. thing. Your default all the time when your mind is still and it's not required to focus on a task, it instantly continues their prayer. Um, so prayer and, and st Bible study, will, you will grow and mature. Uh, ministry. Um, you know, I, I, I've said that uh, every, every Christian is a minister. But it's the same thing as when I say every question is in varying degrees of success and productive. We're not all equally successful. Well, even though we all have ministries, most Christians are not even aware that they are a minister. Ministry just means servant. We're called to service. We're called to do good works. Not to get saved, but because we're servants of God. And, and us. Uh, 
So the question is, Christians, do you have a ministry? I mean, you are a minister. Are you doing anything as a minister? Are you serving God in any way? Do you know what you should be doing? Well, we're, the, Paul says the, the body of Christ is like a body with many parts, hands, arms, legs, mouths, eyes. Right now I'm a mouth. Maybe some people will never be a mouth, but maybe they can be the feet or the hands. But whatever it is, I'd say the first thing in Christ you should do is pray, Lord, reveal to me my ministry. Reveal to me what my gift is, my spiritual gifts that you've given me that I, so that I can serve you. Not to prove I'm saved like Paul Washer wants you to do, but just because it's a joyful thing to serve the Lord. Uh, and then once you understand what your calling is, what your ministry is, what the gift is, then get busy doing it. And not, only, not because it's a labor, but a labor of love. It's a joyful thing. I never have to be dragged to these discussions. But this, this is a religious work we're doing. This is a ministry work we're doing. But I'm doing it because, hey, no one has to pay me. No one has to twist my arm. I love to do it. And you need to find something you can do for God that you love to do. Um, so you've got um, ministry, prayer, Bible study, and then the last thing is fellowship. You need, Paul says that we should prefer the company of believers. But of course, Jesus also said that we should not put our light under a table, but we should put it on top of the table so our light could shine. So he's saying that we need to take the light the Holy Spirit, the, the gospel, out into the world that needs to hear it. And so we need to be in the world. We need to be among people, unsaved people. Absolutely. But we should be happiest when we're th with other believers. He said you don't put it under a bushel. You don't cover it up. You have to go to the places of darkness to be the light. Mm -hmm. So even though we need to be in the world to shine our light, we should also love to be with other believlievers. That's fellowship. You can't have fellowship with a non-believer. Nope. You can you have get the counsel of the ungodly. Yeah. Now I have some friends who are not believers. Me too. Uh, but friendship is not the same as fellowship. Fellowship is based upon our love, our, our common love for, for for Jesus. I have a couple of hardcore atheists that are my friends, and. I get to tell them the good news. I get to prove to them and sneak in proofs of the Bible and proofs of Jesus. And, you know, you never know. Maybe one day if their life's threatened, they'll remember. But I get to be an example of love and grace and not hypocrisy. It's, I really think the hypocrisy and, so, and, and just judgment and a false gospel message of how you got to be good enough for God and all this because their objections the atheists are oh you got to keep all these rules or it'll throw you in fire you know all these objections aren't uh, against the truth they're all against the false gospel and so these people are going to be accountable for creating atheists and giving god a bad name and preaching in a cursed gospel they just don't know it they're going to be the one saying but lord look we were on the corner preaching in your name Warning people to repent of their sins and be like, did I say that's how you get saved? No. Told you to preach the gospel. That he died, that he was buried, that he rose again for your justification, that eternal life is a free gift for all who believe. He didn't go around teaching self-help, uh, clean up your life reformation. That wasn't the gospel. And they're going to answer for it, man. And they're going to answer for coming against us with hatred and doing everything they can to tear us down and shut us up and keep others from hearing it. They will answer for that. There's no doubt. And you, you seen the misery on their faces, the ones that do exposing video, how miserable they are. There's no joy. They always have a scowl. Like Paul Washer is always uh, whining and crying. And, you know, it's just, oh, but he's so sincere. He's sincerely wrong. He's sincerely religious and sincerely has another gospel. Yeah. 
Well, the, the best uh, lies are lies that are partly true. Yep. And, and throughout his sermon, he says things and I'm thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. But don't relate it to salvation. Don't make it a test for salvation. That's spiritual maturity. Don't use that as a test for whether someone's saved. Yeah, I agree with all that. But so um, that's why it's so dangerous. Uh, it's, and people can fall for it if they don't understand the Bible and, and salvation that well. Then it's easy to be deceived by somebody that's mixing some true principles with a, with a false lie from the devil. So, uh, yeah, um, we want you to love Jesus so much more than anyone, anything, and, and we and to um, and love. Uh, uh, and, and hate sin, but you don't even need to be concerned with sin if you're loving and thinking about Jesus. You're, there are no time to think about sinning. So that solves that problem. Uh, but it, but if you do want to become a productive Christian, and why would you? Why, why would someone want to grow and mature as a Christian, sister? But what possible reason would you want to even put the effort into studying the Bible? Because you want to grow in grace and you want to grow in knowledge of your Lord. There's so many hidden nuggets of glorious truth in that in the Bible. There's so many shadows of Jesus and God's love for us and the grace and then the promises of having a more abundant life right here. It tells us, you know, God's ways, we're always accused of not wanting to live for God or love and sin, but God's ways of living bring life to us. There's a solution to every life problem in scripture. It tells you to cast all your cares on God. He'll, he'll take care of all of it. There's comfort in it. I, I want to know him more and it's my way of talking to him and him talking to me. I can hear him. Even when I pray and ask him questions out loud throughout the day, I'll get answers in scripture. It'll be usually a scripture verse that I hear in my mind or in my heart. So I, I want to grow in grace and I want to grow in the knowledge of my Lord. I want to fellowship with him. I want to know about the promises. I want to know about the power and authority he's given me and, and all the promises of God that are yea and amen in him and the uh, better, uh, 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 be better equipped to live in this crazy world and also the promises to come in the future that this will all be right. All these wrongs will be righted and I'm going to be uh, all the stuff I suffer through will be gone. The glories are nothing. The sufferings here are nothing compared to the glories that are before us. Hmm. And it confirms when I struggle to fight for the gospel and the truth of God's unconditional love for all of us in Christ, that, that it strengthens me to keep the fight, to keep going in the fight. Yeah. Well, uh, it is to, to grow in knowledge is, uh, it's the most wonderful thing, uh, at this point in my life, when I was, I remember in school, uh, all the, all my time in school uh, was, um, I did what I needed to do to get B's. That's what I had to get at least B's because uh, my father would require that. And, but uh, it, it wasn't because I was so interested in all the subjects I had to study because they, they chose the subjects for me. Elementary, junior high, high school, co college, you get to pick more of the subjects you're interested in, but you're also required to take a lot of subjects that are just requirements and it may not be something of great interest to you. So uh, learning was not a joy for me back then. But uh, after I became a Christian in December of 1986, I started learning the Bible about Jesus learning has become a joy um when when i when i uh, get a, a revelation about a, a verse in the bible either from the holy spirit or from renee or from rl or from anybody else that can help me to understand it it's just thrilling it's a wonderful thing to learn something and uh, that's why i like also considering 
all the different theological subjects. There's so much to learn. It's so fascinating. And Einstein famously said that man doesn't even know 1% of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just so much to learn about everything. But theology, of course, is the most important and fascinating subject of all. This kind of teaching is what's got the world in confusion because unlike the honest Catholic church, and they are honest, they flat out say, hey, it's faith plus works. But we know the Bible says if you add a work, it's not of grace anymore. You, you can't, They're so opposite. You put one work of righteousness to what Christ did, now you're, you're without a savior. You now are trusting in your own works, and that's what you'll be judged on. And then he'll say, you're a worker of iniquity. Mm -hmm. I liked what Daniel the other night said, in their works, they deny me. Because they trust in their works, they deny what Christ did. That all made me fell out my chair. I was like, that yeah. is yeah. heavy. That is heavy. That is a wonderful thing. You, you see, it, it's so, I don't care who tells me. Anybody who can tell me something that profound is just, thank you. For that gift. You know, the same that. thing happened with me. Every now and then I'll read a verse and I will have read it a hundred times and think it means something else. And then I'll get my breath taken away. And that verse was, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. One day I was sitting in the chair and I was like, <gasps> they're not abusing grace to sin. They turn his grace into lascivious. They're saying it cannot be grace because that's a license to sin. So therefore, they say it can't be grace because that would mean you could just fornicate and do this and this. So they turn God's grace into lasciviousness. Mm -hmm. So they bring you back under the bondage of law because grace is lasciviousness to them. And and I, I lost my breath. I was like, I never saw it that way. I was just reading it one day and it popped and everything twisted in my head because I used to think it meant that people, no, 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 where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. It's not about people abusing grace. These people that turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, they're not even believers. They're against the gospel. So they can't be abusing his grace as a license to say, that's not what it means. These unbelievers are turning, turning that grace into lasciviousness. They're making that message mean something it doesn't. They're, they're making it, they're, they're saying that, no, you have to be under law. You have to do this, this, and this, because grace means you can just fornicate and live some crazy lifestyle. So they turn that grace into lasciviousness. That's why it says we're slanderously reported, you know? It, it Every now and then, something like that will happen. And so when he said that, I was just like, whoa, you know? And it's just... I, I don't have any condemnation over stuff. I got joy. The one thing in my life, I have a lot of physical struggles. I have a lot of other struggles. But the one thing I know is that God's got my back. I am his daughter. He is not mad at me. I am not under his wrath. I am beloved of him. If I call on him, I know he hears my prayers. I don't ever feel alone. I don't feel condemned if I listen to a rock and roll song I like. I can find joy in everything because he came to give life and life more abundantly. Now, along with that came a love for God. And so some things don't feel right anymore. Just can't do them or listen to them or watch them or read them or any of that. But I don't do it based on if he's going to be mad at me. It's because it grieves me. You know, that's the difference. I don't get so many people write me. I had that Kevin Zacker pure word guy do an exposing video because one of my viewers asked, is it OK to do reflexology? And I said, well, the, the Eastern mysticism people, they bring their uh, spiritual beliefs into everything, even how they arrange their furniture, like with feng shui. But reflexology is holistic medicine, which he said it means holy. No, it doesn't. It means the entire body and mind working together to heal. It doesn't mean holy. So he he, he went out saying that I was promoting East, him and Wayne Crook, I think. You know, they, they're together anyway. I don't understand the hatred. I'm like, I have the right Jesus. I have the right gospel. But because I'm a woman, I can't have a 
channel and preach everything I know. I don't say I'm a pastor. I don't, you know, none of that. I'm just a sister. And so they, they come against and they attack for every little thing and they condemn people for stuff like this. All it is is pressure points where a nerve attaches to the kidneys or something where you press on the feet or the hands and it heals another part of the body. But my point is, is people condemn others for stuff like this. And this is the kind of thing that you don't do if it's against your own conscience, because then it's sin to you. But if it's not against your conscience, it's not sin, mm -hmm. you know, but they want to make it sin. And if you say it's not sin, then you're a heretic and you're promoting it and all kinds of stuff. But my thing is you don't be in any bondage. But if you feel condemned, if you do it, research it. If it looks like something that condemns you, don't touch it. Don't do anything against your conscience. What is that verse that says something about if our conscience is clear, we have confidence towards God? Something like that. Didn't it say I that? Don't I don't, I'm, if our conscience does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God or something like that. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's. Uh, we're, we're finished analyzing this sermon. Uh, we'll sum up our thoughts, but first, let's go through the chat room. Say hi to everybody, and and uh, if anybody in the chat room has a question you want us to answer before we're finished with this uh, study of the sermon, any any question about the sermon, uh, just put it in all caps for me now. And we'll answer your question. But in the meantime, let me just say hi to everybody. Uh, RL, I'm so happy to see you there as usual. And a, a brother, I'm, nice and dear. I'm so happy to uh, the uh, RL, brother Mike. Um, every opportunity I have, I, I have for you to, to join me in one of these discussions. I, I'm going to take advantage of that. And uh, look at that. We have brother Jason Jack here. Jason Jack. Yay. Yeah. Love you right back. Uh, one, What's up, Doc? Yeah. Uh, anybody who doesn't know about uh, Brother Jason Jack, uh, please go to his channel, subscribe to his channel. Yes. What a great brother he is. He has he has insights that I have no doubt that uh, had to come from God, uh, and that that are so unique. Amen. And some of the things uh, you may find uh, curious and different, and and, and may not may not want to agree with, but I guarantee you, you'll find it interesting and thought provoking. And, and he knows that gospel and he, he contends for, and he comes against every he false church's doctrine. Defends every the true one. gospel as well as anybody I know. So glad you can be in the chat room with us tonight, brother. Uh, let me see. Some of the people I, I recognize the names and Bible expositor, I'm glad you could be here with us. And Eric Breckenridge. You're pal 27. Uh, if you're here, if you're here for the first time or I'm not that familiar with you, welcome. I, I hope that uh, these studies every Wednesday and also Sundays, uh, Church of the Eternally Secure, that's uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Join us then. Uh, uh, let me see. I don't see any questions. RL, Precious Faith, Hendrix. Hi, Hendrix. Steve Rosberg, nice to see you again. You still working real hard? Uh, Nicole. Sonic Grace is in there. He was. Jessica. Mary did. Miller and Celine. Mary Miller, yeah. Thank Jessica. you. Jessica. Everybody, everybody who's uh, in the chat room participating. Callista. Uh, well, uh, I'm sure that if I go through this chat later, I'll see a lot of interesting comments. I tried to keep Jessica my eye, on, eye on it as we're talking, but sometimes we get all involved in the discussion and I, I can't really stay up with all your comments, but uh, if hey, Steve has, Rosberg, yeah. you wanted us to pray, but I don't have the prayer request in front of me. Do you want to type it in there for brother Luke and I, I have to get my boy to bed. It's after 11 for school. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just say uh, to sum this up. Um, this is the third sermon that we've analyzed the first sermon uh, to many people's surprise, we loved it. It was fantastic by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, titled, um, what was it titled? A Warrant of Faith. 
So I hope you'll watch that because it's one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my life. We are just joyful throughout the whole thing. Uh, the second sermon was by Jonathan Edwards, a very famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And there were, let's say there were 10,000 lines. There's only one line out of 10,000 that we liked. <laughs> That's how horrible it was. Really? It was it? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something about the about, grace of God. Yeah, God's going to torture you and burn you. He's and dangling you over God. hell. Yes. He's dangling you there oh. by a thread. And then this sermon by Paul Washer that's broken a lot of people's hearts and made people uh, lose their assurance. And and uh, so uh, this one is he, just as horrible as, as mm. Tom Edwards um, because it's the Lordship Fault Gospel that not only doesn't save anybody if your faith is divided between Jesus and your own uh, works, but also you never can be assured and confident that you're that you have uh, have an eternal life guaranteed to you because it's and all they're not faith. honest. They yeah. don't admit that they teach works. That's the thing. They just redefine believing in faith to automatically have works involved in them. So instead of belief being pistios or or to trust to rely upon, to take God at his word, they put believing means to be obedient and be faithful. Faith is faithfulness. It's a matter of performance. It's a matter of, it's all something to do with you. Instead of the object of your faith, it now becomes the quality of your faith. So they say, oh no, we pre preach grace through faith alone. It's a free gift. But... And then they tell you what quality your faith must have or else it's just intellectual ascent and spurious faith and all these unbiblical in the Bible. You either believe or you don't. You either have faith or you don't. And it's that simple. God's yeah. not the author of confusion. But MacArthur and all his Arthurites, they go out there making up words like spurious faith, saving faith, intellectual ascent. Nonsense. You take God at his word. You trust in it. God said that he sent his son to die for you and rise again for your justification. If you trust in him, he gives you the free gift of eternal life. His blood washed away and purged all your sins. Hey, I believe him. That's what salvation is. But they'll tell you, no, that's not, that's spurious faith. That's just believing some facts. No, a lot of people believe the facts that he died for his sins was buried and rose again, but they don't trust in it. They don't trust that that actually gives them eternal life. So their preaching works. It's it's yeah. that plus obedience. Yeah. And it's a vague standard. You got to repent of your sins. Well, nobody's repented of all their sins. Well, you got to be willing. Where's that? It says it's not for him that willeth. So where are all these vague things that they're saying you got to do? If you have trusted Christ, you have repented for salvation because God gives repentance, which is the acknowledging of the truth. It means to change your mind, stop trusting in your dead works of the law, in, in idolatry or false religion or baptism or sacraments, and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which is the gospel, what God did for you, not what you do for him. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So sad. Yeah. Well, let me uh, finish by just making a, 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 an announcement. Um, everybody... I want to make sure you're with us next Wednesday because um, I am really fired up. I don't, I, there's not very many things that make me angry, uh, but I am very, very upset uh, about a couple of false doctrines that I'm seeing uh, brought into the, the, the scene among some of our friends that are so horrible that we need to uh, make sure everybody understands the heresy of these two false doctrines. I'm going to tease you. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but talk to Brother Matthias about it. He doesn't usually, uh, he's not with us on Wednesdays, but next Wednesday he's going to join us here. Renee and Matthias and I are going to talk about these two false doctrines that you need to be aware of. We need to stand together. I know one of them, but you got to email me the other one. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I, you, you know both of them, you just can't recall. Uh, but we're um, we're going to be doing that next Wednesday. It's very, very important. So I'm excited to, to uh, confront that because it's one of the things, it's two of the things that 
as I said, we, we have liberty to be wrong about so many things, but there are some things that are they're damnable heresies, and we must speak out against it. So join us next Wednesday, and um, thank you for participating with us tonight. Sister Renee, thank you again. Uh, give, thank uh, you. Give, give a little, little James a big hug for me. And, uh, I will. Uh, thank you all. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. Night, guys.